As the news of Juice World's passing hit, sales rose by 487%. And for Mac Miller, that number was up to 970%. 970%. There's no way in hell you can convince me that people who are a part of these record labels are not looking at this and saying, well, isn't that interesting? D-D-D-I-Y. It is unfortunate that we're at a place in time in hip hop where even the subject of death feels like the content of somebody's video game. I don't treat it like that. I look at this and the first thing I think about when I see rapper death is families, beyond fans, beyond what they represent with their music. And it hasn't always been like that. I think as a fan, the first thing you think about is your own fandom of some of these artists. But the older I get, the more my responsibilities change. One is being a father, as a being a husband. The more you start to think about these folks being breadwinners, these folks being support systems for families. With that said, the name of the video is Why Labels Want Your Favorite Rappers Dead. This video is quite disturbing. It's astonishing to see the long list of rappers who have passed away in recent years. I would read that list, but honestly, it's just way too long. Whereas the deaths of Tupac and Biggie scarred an entire generation of hip-hop fans, today's consumers are so used to seeing their heroes either gunned down or dying from substance abuse. Like the hip-hop bet Jim Jones said, we have more rappers getting killed than we have weeks in a year. Being a rapper in today's society is definitely the most dangerous job in the world. Now, if you would have said that... 10 years ago, that might have sounded like a really ridiculous statement that being a rapper is the most dangerous job in the world. There's literally a TV show I want to see on TLC or one of these channels that talks about the most dangerous jobs around the world. But when you really give that statement some thought, part of what makes you successful in this field as a rapper is your visibility. Part of what looks like success is you pretty much wearing what appears to be your wealth. That's also the same thing that puts a target on your back. We're not even talking about if you're a rapper that talks about violence or you say things that may attract that kind of energy to you, but your literal job description puts a target on your back. One may even argue that the bigger the target, the better you are at your job. Considering how unsafe it is out there, you would think that record labels would be taking steps to save these young artists from prematurely passing. But some rappers believe this is exactly what they want as when a rapper dies, their sales explode. Seriously, I can't believe I'm saying this, but as horrible as it sounds, there's tons of evidence to back this up. But the truth of the matter when it comes to hip-hop, in my opinion, is like we got to stop pretending we care about these people and we care about these kids. This is a business. They want to use you and destroy you and get your money. And it's better for their business if you're dead. That's why they put out albums after you died. If they cared about you as an artist, they wouldn't do that. Shout out Vince Staples. We just recently did a video about him. Somebody gonna have to tell the truth and I'm gonna tell it. I don't know how many of you question it, but I've always questioned the work that comes out after an artist has passed away. I wonder how much of it was actually okay to go out. I think the first time I started paying attention to it was probably after Pac's death. And they talked about all the music that he had recorded in a short window of time after he was released from prison. With that said though, I was younger and just thinking about shallow things like, uh, I wonder what all the music sounded like. The more that I start to look at it from the point of view of an artist, like I'm, I'm an artist myself, man, imagine somebody digging through my folder of beats that I never wanted to finish are songs that really were meant to be scratch ideas. And because I was signed to a company or signed to a label, they're able to just comb through that and squeeze whatever juice they can left out of that and make as much money as they would like through that. It definitely, at the very least, seems like a very insensitive way to monetize off of an artist that has passed away. Every time that a rapper dies, the streaming numbers of their existing catalogs boom. For example, after PMB Rock was tragically shot and killed in 2022, his numbers shot up 652%. PMB Rock, rest in peace PMB Rock, unfortunately was gunned down here in Southern California. There was an increase of 652% of people looking into streaming his music. Now, there may be many a reasons why people do that. Some people are just reminded, oh man, that was a song that I listened to, or maybe it's diehard fans that are saying, man, I gotta stream this. And a lot of folks are just being nosy and wanting to see now what this artist was about, even though they weren't checking for them when they were alive. But 652% is a pretty crazy number. One might believe that's too crazy of a number for a label to ignore. Cause I imagine the ripple effect is 
merchandise going up, and other sales of things that maybe otherwise weren't doing those numbers. His song Selfish also re-entered the charts at number 17, wow. making it his first appearance on the charts in over three years. This track was also released by Atlantic Records, which is the same label that PMB Rock had been at odds with for years over an unfair deal. If I am at odds with a record label and we have not resolved those, under what circumstances does that record label then feel like it is okay for them to then conduct my business? We have unresolved issues. Similarly, when XXXTentacion and Pop Smoke lost their respective lives, their numbers were equally insane. For X, he broke Taylor Swift's one day streaming record, while Pop Smoke's numbers rose by 400%. As the news of Juice World's passing hit, sales rose by 487%. And for Mac Miller, that number was up to 970%. 970%. Without accusing anyone of anything, these numbers, as ridiculous as they are, there's no way in hell you can convince me that people who are a part of these record labels, the ones who are decision makers, are not looking at this and saying, well, isn't that interesting? An artist that you view as an investment, for whatever reason, is not selling like they once did, generating the income they once did when they were first signed. For somebody that's on some diabolical shit, man, maybe this is one last way to cash out on this brand. As ridiculous as that may sound for somebody, you can't ignore that. Because look at these numbers, 970% is increase after Mac Miller's death. That is wild. All of this is absurd when you consider how popular they already were to begin with. So you can see why it's so profitable for labels to have your favorite rappers killed. You know what doesn't often get talked about either? The business of putting these artists as the face of playlist after they pass away are putting their face on a billboard that is at the top of these streaming websites. I wish we could see the stats of how much this increase in percentage in terms of their streams going up is attributed to their face and a RIP being front and center on every streaming platform, if not just Spotify alone, because if that's the case, I hate to say it as insensitive as it may sound, it sounds like it's part of a rollout plan. Shit is sick, bro. It just seems like a tasteless cash grab if they're releasing something the artist never got the chance to veto. Like they're using them for name recognition, which already kind of sucks, but exponentially more so when they're dead. If these labels pose these deals as partnerships, in what business, in what industry is it okay for you to move forward with plans that you never got to discuss with your partner? Because I never see anyone from the label or anyone release news or information that these artists okayed them. If I'm in a partnership with you and I respect you as a partner, your opinion matters. No matter if I'm the investor, we're in a partnership. So to see how aggressive they move forward without the okay from obviously their deceased partner or even doing things in good faith by working with the producers or maybe their family estate. Shockingly, seven of the artists in the top 10 most streamed albums on Spotify are all dead. Seven of the top albums that sit right now, respectively, at the top of the hip hop albums on Spotify are deceased. So those percentages that you saw, they weren't just initial bumps that happened after they passed away. These projects have remained at the top of the list. Horrifying as it may be, death and hip hop sells. And unless you're King Vaughn, Nipsey Hussle, or Young Dolph, who all famously refused to sign to major labels and held on to their masters, a lot of those profits aren't necessarily going to your grieving family member. When a label signs an artist, by nature, it is a financial transaction. For the most part, labels aren't necessarily there to provide guidance, but instead, they're there to promote you for their own ends. The only thing that an artist gets is money and fame, and that's if they survive. After all, most of the time, they've got your publishing rights and masters in exchange for giving you a massive audience, leaving you in debt to them until they recoup. So while it is undeniable that they want to protect their investment, that doesn't necessarily mean that their top priority is the person creating the output. Mm. The investment for them is the music and holding the copyright and licensing rights. But the industry's honesty about their view has never been clearer than what's known as the death clause, which is found in contracts that are signed by artists. Let's see how this works by taking a look at the one Kurt Cobain contract with Nirvana. 
According to the documents, it says that the company shall have the right to secure insurance equivalent to 10 times the estimated value of the artist's earnings from any source of revenue. This death clause says companies shall have the right to secure insurance equivalent 10 times the estimated value of the artist's earnings from any source of revenue. In Cobain's case, where he, quote, shot himself, that amounted to several billion dollars. French Montana explored the prominence of these life insurance policies on Academics' Off the Record podcast. But now it's even crazier because really? they, they getting life insurance on artists. At least back then we didn't have that. Is a label signing an artist in good faith if you're taking a life insurance out of him? No, you're praying, on, you're praying on his death. You're praying on making millions on his death. Why would someone who obviously doesn't respect you enough to honor whatever wishes you may have before you pass away, who already knows the risk of signing you, but yet does not hesitate to allow you to speak about whatever topics may come to mind, right? We've even done stories where Meek Mill has said that some execs encourage a certain topic or encourage a certain amount of violence within the music. How is it that you can market it, you can push it, but then also save your own ass by putting a clause in a contract that says, mm, if things get a little bit too dicey, we need to make sure that we can still make 10 times your earnings, no matter the source those earnings come from. There's no way that you could do that in good faith. His words, not mine. Somebody went out, did some stupid, recorded a song about it, and was able to get a lot of streams, and that became a thing with the whole drill. And they actually going out, getting active and doing stuff, and then going to the studio and make a song about what they just did. And that shit get nipped in the bud as soon as it got created. But nobody's going to these labels saying they wrong for this. We just blaming it on the kids. Putting out life insurance on these young kids now. Wow. The label. Because they're gambling on you to do some dumb yeah. so they can profit after you die. This is getting ridiculous. Have you ever thought about the artists that do go down for some of the things that they get in trouble with, right? By their own doing, they get in trouble, they get hot-headed, they get in a situation and act irrationally. Obviously, they share the majority if not all, the blame or the responsibility, at least, for their actions. But have you thought about how ridiculous it may look contrasting between them and the very execs that have signed them? These folks that don't look like they're from the neighborhoods. They're all dressed up. They're all professionals. And that's something that's always bothered me, because I feel like if you bring these people into a courtroom, I can see jurors. I can see judges leaning more so towards the side of the execs, because after all, they're just doing good business in this good old U.S. of A. But shouldn't they share partly in the responsibility in these acts that they market to the masses that they financially benefit off of that they're already warned about and already nervous about because they got to put a whole last life insurance and death clause in their contract? Oh, but we didn't know no better. Music producers, rappers, and singers, are you looking to get some constructive feedback on your newest music? Joining Critique My Beats is super easy. All you gotta do is reserve a pass at critiquemybeats.com. Click on book a slot and choose if you wanna get one beat review, two beat reviews on our live stream every Monday. Best beat and best song of the night is going to win a cash prize. Join us at Critique My Beats. In my most recent video discussing Waka Flocka Flame, I highlighted his harrowing experience in 2020 when he was shot and robbed. This traumatic event landed him in the hospital for several months, during which he faced temporary memory loss. The gravity of the situation was such that he could have easily lost his life. At that point, Waka was at the height of his career, releasing chart-topping tracks like No Hands and Grove Street Party, and considering he was a prolific asset generating millions of dollars for his label Warner Bros. Record, you would assume that they would rally around him and extend support. However, per Waka's account, this expectation fell tragically short. Nah, they don't think like that. No, when I got shot, my leader went and called me a guy named Ty Moskowitz. He ain't called me and said, yo, you okay? You know what I'm saying? That was Warner Brother. Guess what this man said? Yo, can you record? Somebody gonna have to tell the truth and I'm gonna tell it. I'm gonna give another one for good measure. Keep the suits out the booth. Do you get what I'm saying when I say keep the suits out the booth? This gentleman that he brings up, who is obviously someone who 
is not a rapper. This is someone who I consider a suit, someone who at his label is calling to check on him after he is recovering from temporary memory loss as a result of being shot and robbed. He's been in the hospital for months. And I know it's really hard for some people out there to feel any kind of sympathy for rappers because of the subject matter of their music. But just thinking about from a from a human standpoint, imagine your ass blue collar got shot and robbed and suffered temporary memory loss. And imagine your job, your boss, who you already can't stand, calls your ass on your cell phone and tells you, hey, man, when you think you can get back to work, what in the hell would you tell your boss? That shit is fucking ridiculous. Your partner, who you want to be at their best because that's when they can generate the kind of income you need them to, you're more concerned about when they're able to get their ass back in a studio than whether or not they even have all their faculties or their memory. I, I, I know that we know that the music industry is a cutthroat game, but this shit right here is wild, fam. So man, they fought after I got shot. I never in my life trust ladies. As horrible as this was even back then, the money that was being made off Waka Flocka pales in comparison to how much hip hop can generate today. Over time, the profits have grown so much that there are even conspiracy theories that Empire Records is killing off their artists to cash out these insurance policies after artists on the rosters such as MO3, Young Dolph, King Vaughn, PNB Rock and XXXTentacion have all passed away. Allegedly, I don't care where your tinfoil hat is right now. When you zoom back out and you just look at the amount of artists that have died that were all associated with the same distributor or same label and empire, that shit is enough to make you like, I don't know what the hell's going on from the outside. I don't want none of that shit. I go, to, I go back to MySpace before I sign a deal here. One name, maybe. Two names, maybe. These are all names that are not even associated with each other. When Lil Peep died during his US tour from Xanax Lace with Fentanyl on November 15th, 2017, it was shocking to see how everyone around him was used to him being completely out of it. During his IG stories at the time, Peep regularly popped pills on camera and no one looked to intervene. At the same time, Peep seemed to have been actively calling out for help and was struggling to deal with his anxiety. Soon after, Peep would be dead at 21 years old. Sheesh. And once he passed, his mother, Lisa Womack, began to point out the inadequacies in terms of his management, First Access Entertainment, treated him and eventually sued them for wrongful death. His label and media company, First Access, gave him pills frequently and encouraged him to do drugs to keep up the image. Little Peep is another name that I heard, unfortunately, after he passed away. I wasn't up on Little Peep. This is my first time hearing about how the label and media company that he was associated with. Now, these are pulled from Reddit posts. I don't know how factual these are. So allegedly gave him pills frequently and encouraged him to do drugs to keep up the image, even though Peep wanted to slow down, knowing his use was affecting him negatively. I mean, based upon the stuff we've already seen, it doesn't feel that far fetched. Where the company's CEO, Sarah Stennett, previously told Rolling Stone that she had felt protective of him from day one, once the lawsuits began, she described their dealings as an arm's length business arrangement. So she made a statement before the lawsuit was on their doorstep, which was she had felt protective of Lil Peep from day one. OK, when you assume that responsibility, People are going to ask questions. Where were you when little peep, unfortunately, overdosed? She changed her statement, according to this, and it says our relationship was arm's length as a business arrangement. What if 50 Cent say these industry niggas ain't your friends? They know how to pretend crazy how quickly it switches up when a lawsuit comes. According to them, Lil Peep's contract with First Access was purely of a business nature and not the type of special relationship giving rise to an independent duty of care for one's safety and or well-being. That's how you talk about your partner. So you talk about your partner. Your well-being is not of my concern. It's strictly business here. Maybe that's a reason why when these things happen and the labels get pushed back, you never actually hear. There's never a press conference. If something happens where there's police brutality involved or a police shooting, you always see like a chief of police do a press conference because it directly involves someone that's a part of their department they're representing, right? Rightfully so. It's a good way to be on the same page as the community. You never hear from anybody that are a part of these labels, not because they're directly related, but hell, this is your partner. 
This is somebody you wanted us to know so much about that you marketed them on literally every billboard that you can get them to. You put them on every TV show, every interview that we can get to, every podcast. But all of a sudden, when shit gets too hot, it's it's just business. It's just business. I'm. I, it's unfortunate that that happened, but this is just business. In response, Lisa claimed that they undertook the task of controlling and managing Peep's personal life, even accusing them of propping him on state in a comatose state. Okay. Yo, 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 yo. Can't skim over that. I know I'm stopping this video a lot, but there's a lot of shit to unpack. These folks at his label undertook the task of controlling and managing Peep's personal life, including his food, sleep schedule, money management, health care, drug use and social activities. His mother even accused them of propping Peep up on stage while he was in a comatose like state during the tour's final stop in May 2017 because it's a lot easier just to prop him up than to actually cancel the fucking tour. According to Lisa, Peep, quote, expressed a desire not to perform, which was met with an instruction by his tour managers that he take an excessive amount of Xanax so as to make himself sick, which would in turn trigger insurance coverage of cancellation. Basically, they wouldn't let him cancel the tour, even if it meant saving his life, unless they were going to get their fair share. For those of you that are still pursuing record deals, the best piece of advice that I could give you. You sure about that? You, you, you might want to double check this. If you got your mind set on that, I'm not going to get in your way at all. I just share this as information that you should absolutely be thinking about because you ain't no different. They don't care more about you because you're more talented than somebody else. You better make sure that you got a lawyer on your team that can understand the many loopholes and the many games that their lawyers play. Their lawyers know all about music law. You can't just bring Saul Goodman in there and hope everything's gonna be all right. Considering that Peep recorded at a prolific rate, they could have milked him for years to come if his mom didn't step in and he's not the only one. Take Juice World for example. According to reports that emerged after his incredibly tragic death, the Shy Town artist had recorded over 2,000 unreleased songs during his very short lifetime. At some point, his ex girlfriend Ali Ladi believed that he gave so much to the label in terms of that he ultimately became disposable to them as a person. And according to her, she actually tried to stop him. I would literally sit on his lap every day and be like, don't go record. Since my mom was they don't need they don't need us they don't need you anymore they need so many songs that we're a liability being here now in watching this the first thing that comes to mind is the video that we covered talking about how the major labels are positioning artists to create at a crazy quantity so that they can attack the streaming payouts from a different angle in releasing more songs it gave you more opportunity more digital real estate to generate income from this angle she saw that as dangerous for him to record more music. Why? Because the more music that you record, the less that they'll need you, whether you're here or whether you're deceased. It plays two games at the same time. It plays the streaming game because you're going to always have an abundance of music to put out there to make those coins. And then it also takes advantage of the chance that you die and the 400% surge, I think they said about Juice World, that occurs afterwards. Now we have an abundance of music, projects that we can now release back to back to back after this artist has already passed away during a time where fans are hyper consuming because they miss their favorite artists. If I was an artist that was signed, I'm looking at that completely different. You gotta be a little bit weary of telling people that you're in business with in that business, I got 4,000 songs in a vault. Oh, is that right? So if a rapper forfeits control over their catalog and exploiting it would be profitable, that's exactly what they'll do. Solution. When I'm gone, please don't release any posthumous albums or songs with my name attached. Reads the tattoo on the arm of Anderson Pack. Shout out to Anderson Pack. After he's already walked these industry streets, he decided to put a tattoo that said, when I'm gone, don't release any albums or songs with my name attached to those because they were never intended to be heard. And one may say this is being extreme, but the fact that that's even a thing that is now going to be on him for the rest of his life, it means that much to him. I wish we had an opportunity to talk to some of these artists that passed away who love their music so much and wish they had an opportunity to make a similar statement, but they're not even here 
to speak on their behalf. I imagine many of them may feel the same way. More and more people are waking up to how a label will descend on a dead rapper's leftovers and feast on them till there's nothing left but scraps. As a result, some artists like Anderson Pack and Tyler the Creator are taking steps to prevent this from happening to them. Some of these are so good, I can't oh. just let it sit on a hard drive because I have in my will no. that if I die, no they can't done. put no fucking post out. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out to Tyler the Creator. He just said that he puts it in his will. None of the music that I'm working on that's sitting on my hard drive, you don't have the right to put that out to the public. I think that a lot more rappers, maybe maybe they're not publicly speaking about this. I would imagine that if anything, if they feel any kind of impending danger being in this industry, that could put a layer of protection around them. Because in the event that something does happen to them, well, at least the general public knows that they would have never okayed that. And I would imagine that would hurt business. That would hurt the, the post-death rollout of a label. If we have video like this right here with an artist very clearly to a cheering sold out crowd says, I don't want none of that shit to be out there. None of my music, I don't want none of that to be out there. Many rappers are becoming uncomfortable with projects that are released after someone has died. Granted, these can be done right. Think of Mac Miller's posthumous album, Circle, for example. But when you look at a record like Pop Smoke's Faith, you can clearly see why people are beginning to sour on the concept. Even though he made history with the album when he became the first artist to posthumously debut his first two studio albums at number one on the Billboard 200, his second project was reviled both by those close to him and the fans. With producer Rico Beats claiming that if Pop was alive, he wouldn't have approved 90% of the stuff they put out, Hip Hop DX placed it in their most disappointing albums of 2021 list, declaring that even though the smoke will never clear, it's time to let Pop Smoke's legacy rest. But while there is plenty that hip hop itself can do, that doesn't mean that record companies should be let off the hook either. Hmm. Maybe it is a sign of things to come. Man, I look at this. I would like to say that I'm surprised, but I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. Even the amount of time that I spent in there, I saw enough. I'm grateful that I had the experiences that I had. I'm grateful that as crazy as it may sound that I saw so many of my peers, what they would probably argue their lowest moments, nervous breakdowns that I saw. And when I saw what this industry could do, and then I started seeing it do a bit of a number on me, it was enough for me to be like, you know what? My curiosity is not strong enough for me to keep, keep pursuing this. Opportunities were there. But the day that I chose to be independent uh, was one that I'll never regret. <laughs> At this point, can't even categorize this as propaganda can't even categorize as a conspiracy theory you're hearing people from the inside and i will continue to deliver these they want to say it out loud i'll share it here with folks that i know amongst those of you that are proud to be independents proud to be diyers D -D -I uh for those of you that may be thinking about jumping into this i will not push you out of the way i will not sit up here and 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 you know act like independence is the easiest thing in the world because it's not but please take notice please take notice of the things that you see and ask yourself how would you handle that even better than you how would your mother handle that how would your family handle your estate and is all of that worth the potential fame and the potential money that you think you'll make like really think about what your number is whatever millions that is really give thought to what how much money that is truly ask yourself is that worth some of the bullshit that you see in these stories. And whatever that number is, I hope you know what number that is. And you know what comes along with that. Those are some of my thoughts, though, ladies and gentlemen. Let me know what you think. DIY. DIYers, if you enjoyed this content, make sure that you hit the like button and maybe even consider subscribing. Come on, man. Stop, stop being greedy. Peace.